Chapter One of the Fall of Troy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born thirteen February eighteen forty seven, died twenty five December nineteen thirty. Chapter One. When godlike Hector by Pleiades slain passed, and the pyre had ravened up his flesh, and earth had veiled his bones, the Trojans then tarried in Priam's city, sore afraid before the might of stout heart Aeacus' son, as kind they were, that midst the copses shrink from faring forth to meet a lion grim, but in dense thickets terror huddled cower. So in their fortress shivered these to see that mighty man, of those already dead they thought, of all whose lives he reft away, as by Scamander's outfall on he rushed, and all that in mid-flight to that high wall he slew, how he quelled Hector, how he held his course round Troy, yea, and of all beside laid low by him since that first day, whereon o'er restless seas he brought the Trojans' doom. Ay, all these they remembered, while they stayed thus in their town, and o'er them anguished grief hovered, dark winged as though that very day all troy with shrieks were crumbling down in fire then from thermodon from broad sweeping streams came clothed upon with beauty of goddesses penthesilea came a thirst indeed for grown resounding battle but yet more fleeing aboard reproach and evil fame lest they of her own folk should veil on her because of her own sister's death for whom ever her sorrows waxed Hippolyte, whom she had struck dead with her mighty spear, not of her will, twas at a stag she hurled. So came she to the far-famed land of Troy. Yea, and her warrior spirit pricked her on, of murder's dread pollution thus to cleanse her soul, and with such sacrifice to appease the awful ones, the Arrhenius, who in wrath for her slain sister straightway haunted her, unseen, for ever round the sinner's steps they hover. None may escape those goddesses. And with her followed twelve beside, Each one a princess, Hot for war and battle grim, Far famous each, Yet had maidens unto her. Penthesilea far outshone them all. As when in the broad sky Amidst the stars the moon rides over all preeminent, When through the thunder clouds the cleaving heavens open, When sleep the fury-breathing winds, so peerless was she mid that charging host. Cone was there, Palamusa, Doenoe, Evandra, and Antandre, and Ramusa, Hepothoe, dark-eyed Homothoe, Alcibe, Taramachia, Antebrote, and Thermodosa, glorying with the spear. All these to battle fared with warrior-souled Penthesilea. Even as when descends dawn from Olympus' crest of adamant, Dawn, heart exulting in her radiant steeds amidst the bright-haired hours, and o'er them all, how flawless fair soever these may be, her splendor of beauty glows preeminent, so peerless met all the Amazons unto Troy town, Penthesilea came. To right, to left, from all sides hurrying thronged the Trojans, greatly marveling when they saw the tireless war-god's child, the mailed maid, like to the blessed gods, for in her face glowed beauty glorious and terrible. Her smile was ravishing. Beneath her brows, her love in kindling eyes shone like to stars, and with the crimson rose of shamefastness bright were her cheeks, and mantled over them unearthly grace with battle prowess clad. Then joyed Troy's folk, despite past agonies, as when, far gazing from a height, the hinds behold a rainbow spanning the wide sea, when they be yearning for the heaven-sent shower, when the parched field be craving for the rain. Then the great sky is at last overgloomed, and men see that fair sign of coming wind and imminent rain, and seeing they are glad, who for their cornfields plate soar sighed before. Even so the sons of Troy, when they beheld there in their land Penthesilea dread, a fire for battle were exceeding glad. For when the heart is thrilled with hope of good, all smart of evil's past is wiped away. So, after all his sighing and his pain, 
gladdened a little while was Priam's soul, as when a man who hath suffered many a pang from blinded eyes, sore longing to behold the light, and, if he may not, fain would die, then at the last, by a cunning leech's skill, or by a god's grace, sees the dawn-rose flush, sees the mist roll back from before his eyes. Yea, though clear vision come not as of old, yet, after all his anguish, joys to have some small relief, albeit the stings of pain prick sharply yet beneath his eyelids. So joyed the old king to see that terrible queen, the shadowy joy of one in anguish whelmed for slain sons. Into his halls he led the maid, and with glad welcome honoured her, as one who greets a daughter to her home returned from a far country in the twentieth year, and set a feast before her, sumptuous as battle-glorious kings who have brought low nations of foes, arrayed in splendour of pomp, with hearts in pride of victory triumphing. And gifts he gave her, costly and fair to see, and pledged him to give many more, so she would save the Trojans from the imminent doom. And she, such deed she promised as no man had hoped for, even to lay Achilles low, to smite the wide host of the Argive men, and cast the brands red flaming on the ships. Ah, fool! But little she knew him, the lord of ashen spears, how far Achilles might in warrior-wasting strife are past her own. But when Andromache, the stately child of King Etion, heard the wild queen's vaunt, lo, to her own soul bitterly murmured she, Ah, hapless! Why with arrogant heart dost thou speak such great swelling words? No strength is thine to grapple in fight with Peleus all his son. Nay, doom and swift death shall he deal to thee. Alas for thee! What madness thrills thy soul! Fate and the end of death stand hard by thee. Hector was mightier far to wield the spear than thou, yet was for all his prowess slain, slain for the bitter grief of Troy, whose folk the city through looked on him as a god. My glory, and his noble parent's glory, was he yet while he lived. Oh, that the earth over my dead face had been mounded high, or ever through his throat the breath of life followed the cleaving spear. But now I have looked, woe is me, on grief unutterable, when round the city those fleet-foot steeds held him, steeds of Achilles, who made me widowed of mine hero husband, made my portion bitterness through all my days. So spake Etion's lovely ankled child, low to her own soul, thinking on her lord, so evermore the faithful-hearted wife nurseth for her lost love undying grief. Then in swift revolution sweeping round, into the ocean's deep stream sank the sun, and daylight died. So when the banqueters ceased from the wine-cups and the goodly feast, then did the handmaiden spread in Priam's hall for Penthesilea dauntless sold the couch, heart cheering, and she laid her down to rest, and slumber, mist-like, overveiled her eyes like sweet dew dropping round. From heaven's blue depths slid down the might of a deceitful dream at palace hest, so that the warrior maid might see it, and become a curse to Troy, and to herself, when strained her soul to meet the whirlwind of the battle. In this wise the trito born, the subtle souled contrived stood o'er the maiden's head that baleful dream in likeness of her father kindling her fearlessly front to front to meet in fight fleetfoot achilles and she heard the voice and all her heart exulted for she weened that she should on that dawning day achieve a mighty deed in battle's deadly toil ah fool who trusted for her sorrow a dream out of the sunless land such as beguiles full off the travel burdened tribes of men whispering mocking lies in sleeping years, and to the battle's travail lured her then. But when the dawn, rosy ankled, leapt up from her bed, then, clad in mighty strength of spirit, suddenly from her couch uprose Penthesilea. Then did she array her shoulders in those wondrous-fashioned arms given her of the war-god. First she laid beneath her silver-gleaming knees the greaves, fashioned of gold, close-clipping the strong limbs, her rainbow-radiant corslet clasped she then about her, and around her shoulders slung, with glory in her heart, 
the massy brand whose shining length was in a scabbard sheathed of ivory and silver. Next her shield, unearthly splendid, caught she up, whose rim swelled like the young moon's arching chariot rail, when high o'er ocean's fathomless flowing stream she rises, with the space half filled with light betwixt her bowing horns. So did it shine, unutterably fair. Then on her head she settled the bright helmet, overstreamed with a wild mane of golden glistering hairs. So stood she, lapped about with flaming mail, in semblance like the lightning, which the might, the never-wearied might of Zeus, to earth hurleth, what time he showeth forth to men, fury of thunderous roaring rain, or swoop resistless of his shouting host of winds. Then in hot haste, forth of her power to pass, caught she two javelins in the hand that grasped her shield-hand, but her strong right hand laid hold on a huge halberd, sharp of either blade, which terrible Eris gave to Ares' child to be her titan weapon in the strife that raveneth souls of men. <laughs> Laughing for glee thereover, swiftly flashed she forth the ring of towers. Her coming kindled all the sons of Troy to rush into the battle forth which crowneth men with glory. Swiftly all hearkened to her gathering cry, and thronging came, champions, Yea, even such as theretofore shrank back from standing in the ranks of war against Achilles the all-ravager. But she, in pride of triumph on she rode, thrown it on a goodly steed and fleet, the gift of Orathaea, the wild north wind's bride, given to her guest the warrior maid, what time she came to Thrace, a steed whose flying feet could match the harpy's wings. Riding thereon, Penthesilea in her goodly head, left the tall palaces of Troy behind. And ever were the ghastly-visaged fates thrusting her on into the battle, doomed to be her first against the Greeks, and last. To right, to left, with unreturning feet, the Trojan thousands followed to the fray, the pitiless fray that death-doomed warrior made, followed in throngs, as follow sheep the ram that by the shepherd's art strides before all. So followed they, with battle-fury filled, strong Trojans and wild-hearted Amazons. And like Tritonis seemed she, as she went to meet the giants. Or as flasheth far through war-host, Eris, waker of onset shouts. So mighty in the Trojans' midst she seemed, Penthesilea of the flying feet. Then unto Cronos' son, Laomedon's child, upraised his hands, his sorrow-burdened hands, turning him toward the sky-encountering fane of Zeus of Ida, who with sleepless eyes looks ever down on Ilium. And he prayed, Father, give ear! Vouchsafe that on this day Achaea's host may fall before the hands of this, our warrior queen, the war-god's child. And do thou bring her back unscathed again unto mine hall. We pray thee, by the love thou bearest to Ares of the fiery heart thy son, Yea, to her also. Is she not most wondrous like the heavenly goddess is? And is she not the child of thine own seed? Pity my stricken heart withal. Thou knowest all the agonies I have suffered in the deaths of dear sons, whom the fates have torn from me by Argive hands in the devouring fight. Compassionate us, while a remnant yet remains of noble Dardanus blood, while yet the city stands unwasted, let us know from ghastly slaughter and strife one breathing space. So in passionate prayer he spake. Lo, with shrill scream, swift to left an eagle darted by, and in his talons bare a gasping dove. Then round the heart of Priam all the blood was chilled with fear. Lo, to his soul he said, Never shall I see return alive from war, Penthesilea. On that self-same day the fates prepared his boding to fulfill, and his heart break with anguish of despair. Marvelled the Argives, far across the plain, seeing the host of Troy charge down upon them, and midst them Penthesilea, Ares' child. These seemed like ravening beasts that mid the hills bring grimly slaughter to fleecy flocks, and she, as a rushing blast of flame she seemed, that maddeneth through the copses summer scorched, when the wind drives it on, and in this wise spake one to other in their mustering host. 
Who shall this be who thus can rouse to war the Trojans, now that Hector hath been slain? These, who we said, would never more find heart to stand against us. Lo, now suddenly forth they are rushing, madly afire for fight. Sure in their midst some great one kindleth them to battle's toil. Thou verily wouldst say this were a god, of such great deeds he dreams. Go to, with all this courage let us arm our own breast. Let us summon up our might in battle fury. We shall not lack help of gods this day to close in fight with Troy. So cried they, and their flashing battle gear cast they about them. Forth the ships they poured, clad in the rage of fight as with a cloak. Then front to front their battles closed, like beasts of ravin, locked in tangle of gory strife. Clang their bright mail together, clasp the spears, the corslets, and the stubborn welded shields and adamant helms. Each stabbed at other's flesh with a fierce brass, was neither ruth nor rest, and all the Trojan soil was crimson red. Then first Penthesilea smote and slew Molion. Now Personius falls, and now Ilius, reeled Antiphius neath her spear. The pride of Lemnos quelled she. Down she bore Apollonus neath her horse hooves. Hamion's son died, withered stalwart Alasippus' strength. And Doenoe laid low Laogonus, and Clone Menippus, him who sailed long since from Phalace, led by his lord Protosilaus to the war with Troy. Then was Pedarses, son of Iphiclus, heart wrung with ruth and wrath to see him lie dead, of all battle comrades best beloved. Swiftly at Clone he hurled, the maid fair as a goddess. Plunged the unswerving lance twixt hip and hip, and rushed the dark blood forth after the spear, and all her bowels gushed out. Then wroth was Penthesilea, through the brawn of his right arm she drave the long spear's point. She shore a-twain the great blood-brimming veins, and through the wide gash of the wound the gore spirited, a crimson fountain. With a groan, backward he sprang, his courage wholly quelled by bitter pain, and sorrow and dismay thrilled as he fled his men of Phalace. A short while from the fight he reeled aside, and in his friend's arms died in little space. Then with his lance Idomeneus thrust out, and by the right breast stabbed Bermusa. Stilled for ever was the beating of her heart. She fell, as falls a graceful shafted pine, hewn mid the hills by woodmen. Heavily, sighing through all its boughs, it crashes down. So with a wailing shriek she fell, and death unstrung her every limb, her breathing soul mingled with multitudinous sighing winds. Then... As Evandre through the murderous fray with Thermodosa rushed, stood Moronis, a lion in the path, and slew. His spear right through the heart of one he drave, and one stabbed with a lightning sword thrust twixt the hips, let through the wounds the life, and fled away. Oelius' fiery son smote the winnowy twixt throat and shoulders with his ruthless spear. And on Alcibe, Tidius' terrible son swooped, and on Dermachia, Head with neck clean from the shoulders of these twain he shore with ruin reeking brand. Together down fell they, as young calves by the massy axe of brawny flesher felled, that shearing through the sinews of the neck lops life away. So by the hands of Tydeus' son laid low upon the Trojan plains, far, far away from their highland home fell they. Nor these alone died. For the might of Stentalus down on them hurled Cabiris' course, who came from Sestos, keen to fight the Argive foe, but never saw his fatherland again. Then was the heart of Paris filled with wrath for a friend slain. Full upon Stentalus aimed he a shaft death-wind, yet touched him not, despite his thirst for vengeance. Otherwhere the arrow glanced aside, and carried death, whither the stern fates guided its fierce wing, and slew Evenor, brazen tasleted who from Dilichium came to war with Troy. For his death, fury kindled was the son of haughty Pylus. As a lion leaps upon the flock, so swiftly rushed he. All shrank huddling back before that terrible man. If Imonus he slew, and Hippasus' son Agalus, from Miletus brought they war against the Danian men, by Nastus led, the godlike, and Aphomachus mighty souled. On Machile they dwelt, Beside their home rose Latmus' snowy crest, stretched the long glens of branches and Parnomus' water meads. Meander's flood deep rolling swept thereby, 
which from the Phrygian uplands, pastured o'er by myriad flocks, from a thousand forelands curls, swirls, and drives his hurrying ripples on, down to the vine-clad land of carrion men. These mid the storm of battle Mega slew, nor these alone, but whomsoe'er his lance black shafted touched were dead men, for his breast the glorious Trito born with courage thrilled to bring to all his foes the day of doom. And Polypoetes, dear to Ares, slew Jaseus, whom the nymph Nia bare to passing wise Theodemus. For these was spread the bed of love, beside the foot of Sapylus the mountain, where the gods made Niobe a stony rock, wherefrom tears ever stream. High up, the rugged crag bows as one weeping. Weeping waterfalls cry from far echoing Hermes, wailing moan of sympathy. The sky encountering crest of Sapylus, where always floats a mist, hated of shepherds, echo back the cry. Weird marvel seems that rock of Niobe to men that pass with feet fear goaded. There they see the likeness of a woman bowed in depths of anguish sobbing, and her tears drop as she mourns grief-stricken, endlessly. Yea, thou wouldst say that verily so it was, viewing it from afar. But when hard by thou standest, all the illusion vanishes. And lo, a steep-browed rock, a fragment rent from Sapylus. Yet Niobe is there, Treeing her weird, the debt of wrath divine, a broken heart in guise of shattered stone. All through the tangle of that desperate fray stalk slaughter and doom. The incarnate onset shout, rave through the rolling battle. At her side paced death, the ruthless, and the fearful faces, the fates beside them strode, and in red hands bear murder and the groans of dying men. That day the beating of full many a heart, Trojan and Argive, was forever stilled, while roared the battle round them, while the fury of Penthesilea fainted not nor fell. But as mid long ridges of lone hills a lioness, stealing down a deep ravine, springs on the kine with lightning leap, a thirst for blood wherein her fierce heart reveleth, so on the Danians leapt that warrior maid, and they... Their souls were cowed, backward they shrank, as fast she followed, as a towering surge chases across the thunder-booming sea a flying bark, whose white sails strain beneath the wind's wild buffeting, and all the air maddens with roaring as the rollers crash on the black foreland, looming on the lee, where the long reefs fringe the surf-tormented shores. So chased she, and so dashed the ranks asunder, triumphant souled, and hurled fierce threats before. Ye dogs, this day for outraged unto Priam shall ye pay. No man of you shall from my hands deliver his own life, and win back home to gladden parents' eyes, or comfort wife or children. Ye shall lie dead, ravened on by vultures and by wolves, and none shall heap the earth mound o'er your clay. Where sulketh now the strength of Tydeus' son, and where the might of Aeacus Scion? Where is Aeacus' bulk? Ye vaunt them mightiest men of all your rabble. Ha! They will not dare with me to close in battle, lest I drag forth from their fainting frames their craven souls. Then, heart uplifted, leapt she on the foe, resistless as a tigeress, crashing through ranks upon ranks of archives, smiting now with that huge halberd, massy-headed, now hurling the keen dart, while her battle-horse flashed through the fight, and on his shoulder bare quiver and bow, death speeding close to her hand, if mid that revel of blood she willed to speed the bitter biting shaft. Behind her swept the charging lines of men fleet-footed, friends and brethren of the man, who never flinched from close death grapple, Hector, panting all the hot breath of the war-god from their breast, all slaying Danians with the ashen spear, who fell as frost-touched leaves in autumn fall, one after other, or as drops of rain. And I went up a-moaning from the earth's breast, all blood bedrenched, and heaped with course on course. Horses pierced through with arrows, or impelled on spears, were snorting forth their last of strength with screaming neighs. 
men with gnashing teeth biting the dust lay gasping while the steeds of trojan charioteers stormed in pursuit trampling the dying mingled with the dead as oxen trample corn in threshing floors then one exulting boasted mid the host of troy beholding penthesileia rush on through the foe's array like the black storm that maddens o'er the sea what time the sun allies his might with winter's goat-horned star and thus puffed up with vain hope shouted he o friends in manifest presence down from heaven one of the deathless gods this day hath come to fight the archives all of love of us yea and with sanction of almighty zeus he whose compassion now remembereth haply strong-hearted priam who may boast for his a lineage of immortal blood nay surely she shall be athene or the mighty solino haply iris or the child of leto world renowned oh yea i look to see her hurl mid yon argive men mad shrieking slaughter see her set aflame yon ships wherein they came long years agone bringing us many sorrows yea they came bringing us woes of war intolerable ha to the homeland hellas ne'er shall these with joy return since gods on our side fight in overweening exultation so vaunted a trojan fool he had no vision of ruin onward rushing upon himself and troy and penthesilea's self withal for not as yet had any tidings come of that wild fray to aeas stormy souled nor to achilles waster of tower and town but on the grave mound of minoiteus son they twain were lying with sad memories of a dear comrade crushed and echoing each one the other's groaning one it was of the blessed gods who still was holding back these from the battle tumult far away till many greeks should fill up the measure of woeful havoc slain by trojan foes and glorious penthesilea who pursued with murderous intent their rifled ranks while ever waxed her valour more and more and waxed her might within her never in vain she hurled the unswerving spear thrust ay she pierced the backs of them that fled the breasts as such as charged to meet her all the long shaft dripped with steaming blood swift were her feet as wind as down she swooped her aweless spirit fell for weariness nor fainted but her might was adamantine the impending doom which roused unto the terrible strife not yet achilles clothed her still with glory still aloof the dread power stood and still would shed splendour of triumph o'er the death ordained but for a little space ere it should quell that maiden neath the hands of aeacus son in darkness ambushed with invisible hand ever it thrust her on and drew her feet destructionward and lit her path to death with glory while she slew foe after foe as when within a dewy garden close longing for its green springtide freshness leaps a heifer and there ranges to and fro when none is by to stay her treading down all its green herbs and all its wealth of bloom devouring greedily this and marring that with trampling feet so reigned she ares child through reeling squadrons of achaea's sons slew these and hunted those in panic rout from troy afar the women marvelling gazed at the maid's battle prowess suddenly a fiery passion for the fray hath seized antimachus daughter nenoptolemus wife persephone her heart waxed strong and filled with lust of fight she cried to her fellows all with desperate daring words to spur them on to woeful war by recklessness made strong friends let a heart of valour in our breast awake let us be like our lords who fight with foes for fatherland for babes and us and never pause for breath in that stern strife let us too throne war spirit in our hearts let us too face the fight which favoureth none for we we women be not creatures cast in diverse mould from men to us is given such energy of life as stirs in them eyes have we like to theirs and limbs throughout are we fashioned alike one common light we look on and one common air we breathe with like food we are nourished nay wherein have we been dowered of god more niggardly than men 
then let us shrink not from the fray see ye not yonder a woman far excelling men in grapple of fight yet is her blood nowise akin to ours nor fighteth she for her own city for an alien king she warreth of her own heart's prompting fears the face of no man for her soul is thrilled with valour and her spirit invincible but we to right to left lie woes on woes about our feet this more the beloved sons and that a husband who for hearth and home hath died some well for fathers now no more some grief for brethren and for kinsmen lost none but hath some share in sorrow's cup behind all this a fearful shadow looms the day of bondage therefore flinch ye not from war o sorrow laden better far to die in battle now than afterwards hence be held into captivity to alien folk we and our little ones in the stern grip of fate leaving behind a burning city and our husbands graves so cried she and with passion for stern war thrilled all those women and with eager speed they hastened to go forth without the wall mail-clad a fire to battle for their town and people all their spirit was aflame as when within a hive when winter tide is over and gone loud hum the swarming bees what time they make them ready forth to fare to bright flower pastures and no more endure to linger there within but each to other crieth the challenge cry to sally forth even so bestirred the women of troy and kindled each her sister to the fray the weaving wool the distaff far they flung and two grim weapons stretched their eager hands and now without the city had these died in that wild battle as their husbands died and the strong amazons died had not one voice of wisdom cried to stay their maddened feet when with dissuading words theano spake wherefore ah wherefore to the toil and strain of battle's fearful tumult do ye yearn infatuate ones never your limbs have toiled in conflict yet in utter ignorance panting for labour unendurable ye rush on all unthinking for your strength can never be as that of danian men men trained in daily battle amazons have joyed in ruthless fight in charging steeds from the beginning all the toil of men do they endure and therefore evermore the spirit of the war-god thrills them through they fall not short of men in anything their labour-hardened frames make great their hearts for all achievement never faint their knees nor tremble rumour speaks their queen to be a daughter of the mighty lord of war therefore no woman may compare with her in prowess if she be a woman not a god come down in answer to our prayers yea of one blood be all the race of men yet unto diverse labours still they turn and that for each is evermore the best whereto he bringeth skill of use and want therefore do ye from the tumult of the fray hold you aloof and in your woman's bowers before the loom pace ye still to and fro and war shall be the business of our lords lo a fair issue is their hope we see the achaeans falling fast we see the might of our men waxing ever fear is none of evil issue now the pitiless foe beleaguer not the town no desperate need is there that women should go forth to war so cried she and they hearkened to the words of her who had garnered wisdom from the years so from afar they watched the fight but still Penthesilea break the ranks and still before her quell the achaeans still they found nor screen nor hiding place from imminent death as bleating goats are by the blood-stained jaws of a grim panther torn so slain were they in each man's heart all lust of battle died and fear alone lived this way and that fled the panic-stricken some to earth had flung their armour from their shoulders some in dust grovelled in terror neath their shields the steeds fled through the rout unreined of charioteers in rapture of triumph charged the amazons with groan and scream of agony died the greeks withered their manhood was in that sore strait brief was the span of all whom that fierce maid mid the grim jaws of battle overtook as when with mighty roaring bursteth down a storm upon the forest trees and some upreddeth by the roots 
and on earth dashes them down, the tall stems blossom crowned, and snappeth some athwart the trunk, and high whirls them through the air, till all confused they lie, a ruin of splintered stems and shattered sprays. So the great Danian host lay, dashed to dust by doom of fate, by Penthesilea's spear. But when the very ships were now at point to be by hands of Trojans set aflame, then battle bider Aeas heard afar the panic cries, and spake to Aeacus' son, Achilles, the air about mine ears is full of multitudinous cries, is full of thunder of battle rolling near our eye. Let us go forth then, ere the Trojans win unto the ships, and make great slaughter there of Argive men, and set the ships aflame. Foulest reproach such thing on thee and me should bring, for it beseems not that the seed of mighty Zeus should shame the sacred blood of hero fathers, who themselves of old with Hercules the battle-eager sailed to Troy, and smote her even at her height of glory when my Amadon was king. Ay, and I ween that our hands even now shall do the like. We too are mighty men. He spake. The aweless strength of Aeacus' son hearkened thereto, for also to his ears by this the roar of bitter battle came. Then hastened both, and donned their warrior gear, all splendor gleaming. Now in these arrayed, facing that stormy tossing bout they stand, loud clash their glorious armor, in their souls a battle fury like the war god's wrath maddened. Such might was breathed into these train by a tritone, shaker of the shield, as on they pressed. With joy the Argives saw the coming of that mighty train. They seemed in semblance like Aeolius' giant sons, who in the old time made that haughty vaunt of piling on Olympus' brow the height of Asa, steeply towering, and the crest of sky-encountering Peleon, so to rear a mountain stair for their rebellious rage to scale the highest heaven. Huge as these the sons of Aeacus seemed, as forth they strode to stem the tide of war, a gladsome sight to friends who have fainted for their coming. Now onward they press to crush triumphant foes. Many they slew with their resistless spears. As when two herd-destroying lions come on sheep mid the copses feeding, far from help of shepherds, and in heaps on heaps slay them, till they have drunk into the full of blood, and fill their maws and satiate with flesh, so those destroyers twain slew on, spreading wide havoc through the host of Troy. There Diochus and gallant Hylus fell by Aeas slain, fell Eurynomus, lover of war, and goodly Aeneas died. But Peleus' son burst on the Amazons, smiting Antandre, Palamusa then, Antabrote, Fierce souled Hippothoe, hurling Hermothoe down on sisters slain. Then hard on all their reeling ranks he pressed with Telamon's mighty hearted son, and now before their hands battalions dense and strong crumbled as weakly and as suddenly as when in mountain folds the forest breaks shrivel before a tempest driven fire. When battle eager Penthesilea saw these twain, as through the scourging storm of war like ravening beasts they rushed to meet them there she sped as when a leopard grim whose mood is deadly leaps from forest covers forth lashing her tail on hunters closing round while these in armor clad and putting trust in their long spears await her lightning leap so did those warriors twain with spears upswung wait penthesilea clang the brazen plates about their shoulders as they moved and first leapt the long-shafted lance, sped from the hand of goodly Penthesilea. Straight it flew to the shield of Aeacus' son, but glancing thence, this way and that, the shivered fragments sprang, as from a rock face, of such temper were the cunning-hearted fire-god's gifts divine. Then in her hand the warrior maid swung up a second javelin, fury-winged, against Aeas, and with fierce words defied the twain. Ha! From mine hand in vain one lance hath leapt. But with this second, look I suddenly to quell the strength and courage of two foes. 
Aye, though ye vaunt ye mighty men of war amid your Danians, die ye shall, and so lighter shall be the load of war's affliction that lies upon the Trojan chariot lords. Draw nigh, come through the press to grips with me, so shall ye learn what might wells up in breast of Amazons. With my blood is mingled war. No mortal man begat me, but the lord of war, insatiate of the battle cry. Therefore my might is more than any man's. With scornful laughter spake she, then she hurled her second lance, but they in utter scorn laughed now, as swiftly flew the shaft, and smote the silver greave of Aeas, and was foiled thereby, and all its fury could not scar the flesh within, for fate had ordered not that any blade of foes should taste the blood of Aeas in the bitter war. But he wrecked of the Amazon naught, but turned him thence to rush upon the Trojan host, and left Penthesilea unto Peleus' son alone. For well he knew his heart within, that she, for all her prowers, none the less would cost Achilles' battle toil as light, as effortless as doth the dove the hawk. Then groaned she an angry groan, that she had sped her shafts in vain, and now with scoffing speech to her in turn the son of peleus spake woman with what vain vaunting triumphing hast thou come against us all athirst to battle with us who be mightier far than earth-born heroes we from chronos son the thunder roller boast our high descent ay even hector quelled the battle swift before us e'en though far away he saw our onrush to battle grim Yea, my spear slew him for all his might. But thou, thine heart is utterly mad, that thou hast dared to greatly threaten us with death this day. On thee thy latest hour shall swiftly come, is come. Thee not thy sire the war-god now shall pluck out of mine hand, but thou the debt shall pay of a dark doom. As when mid mountain folds a pricket meets a lion, waster of herds. What woman hast thou not heard of the heaps of slain that into Xanthos rushing streams were thrust by these mine hands? Or hast thou heard in vain, because the blessed ones have stolen wit and discretion from thee, to the end that doom's relentless gulf might gape for thee? He spake. He swung up in his mighty hand and sped the long spear, warrior slaying, wrought by Chiron, and above the right breast pierced the battle eager maid. The red blood leapt forth as a fountain wells, and all at once fainted the strength of Penthesilea's limbs, dropped the great battle axe from her nerveless hand. A mist of darkness overveiled her eyes, and anguish thrilled her soul. Yet even so, still she drew difficult breath still dimly saw the hero even now in act to drag her from the swift steed's back confusedly she thought or shall i draw my mighty sword and bide achilles fiery onrush or hastily cast me from my fleet horse down to earth and kneel unto this godlike man and with wild breath promise for ransoming great heaps of brass and gold which pacify the hearts of victors never saw a thirst for blood if so, haply the murderous might of Aeacus' son may hearken, and may spare, or peradventure may compassionate my youth, and vouchsafe me to behold mine home again, for, oh, I long to live. So surged the wild thoughts in her, but the gods ordained it otherwise. Even now rushed on in terrible anger Peleus' son. He thrust with sudden spear, and on its shaft, impelled the body of her tempest-footed steed even as a man in haste to sup might pierce flesh with a spit above the glowing hearth to roast it or as in a mountain glade a hunter sends the shaft of death clear through the body of a stag with such winged speed that the fierce dart leaps forth beyond to plunge into the tall stem of an oak or pine so that death ravening spear of peleus son clear through the goodly steed rushed on and pierced Penthesilea. Straightway fell she down into the dust of earth, the arms of death, in grace and comeliness fell, for naught of shame dishonored her fair form. Face down she lay, on the long spear outgasping her last breath, stretched upon that fleet horse, 
as on a couch like some tall pine snapped by the icy mace of boreas earth's forest fosterling reared by a spring to stately height amidst long mountain glens a glory of mother earth so from the once fleet steed low fallen lay penthesilea all her shattered strength brought down to this and all her loveliness as when on the wide sea neath buffetings of storm blast castaways whose ship is wrecked escape a remnant of a crew for spent with desperate conflict with the cruel sea late and at last appears the land hard by appears a city faint and wearied limbed with that grim struggle through the surf they strain to land sore grieving for the good ship lost and shipmates whom the terrible surge dragged down to nether gloom so troyward as they fled from battle all those trojans wept for her the child of the resistless war-god wept for friends who died in groan resounding fight then over her with scornful laugh the son of peleus vaunted in the dust lie there a prey to teeth of dogs to raven's beaks thou wretched thing who cousin thee to come forth against me and thoughtest thou to fare home from the war alive to bear with thee right royal gifts from priam the old king thy guerdon for slain argives ha twas not the immortals who inspired thee with this thought who know that i of heroes mightiest am the danians light of safety but a woe to trojans and to thee o evil starred nay but it was the darkness shrouded fates and thine own folly of soul that pricked thee on to leave the works of women and to fare to war from which strong men shrink shuddering back so spake he and his ashen spear the son of peleus drew from that swift horse and from penthesilea in death's agony then steed and rider gasped their lives away slain by one spear now from her head he plucked the helmet splendor flashing like the beams of the great sun or zeus own glory light then there as fallen in dust and blood she lay rose like the breaking of the dawn to view neath dainty penciled brows a lovely face lovely in death the argives thronged around and all they saw and marvelled for she seemed like an immortal in her armor there upon the earth she lay and seemed the child of zeus the tireless huntress artemis sleeping what time her feet forwearied are with following lions with her flying shafts over the hills far stretching she was made a wonder of beauty even in her death by aphrodite glorious crowned the bride of the strong war-god to the end that he the noble son of peleus might be pierced by the sharp arrow of repentant love yea and achilles heart was wrung with love's remorse to have slain a thing so sweet who might have borne her home his queenly bride to chariot glorious pythia for she was flawless a very daughter of the gods divinely tall and most divinely fair then ares heart was thrilled with grief and rage for his child slain straight from olympus down he darted swift and bright as thunderbolt terribly flashing for the mighty hand of zeus far leaping o'er the trackless sea or flaming o'er the land while shuddereth all wide olympus as it passeth by so through the quivering air with heart of flame swooped ares armor clad soon as he heard the dread doom of his daughter for the gales the north wind's fleet-winged daughters bare to him as through the wide halls of the sky he strode the tidings of the maiden's woeful end soon as he heard it like a tempest blast down to the ridges of ida leapt he quaked under his feet the long glens and ravines deep scored all ida's torrent beds and all far-stretching foothills now had ares brought a day of mourning on the myrmidons but zeus himself from far olympus sent mid shattering thunders terror of levin bolts which thick and fast leapt through the welkin down before his feet blazing with fearful flames and ares saw 
and knew the stormy threat of the mighty thundering father, and he stayed his eager feet, now on the very brink of battle's turmoil. As when some huge crag, thrust from a beetling cliff-brow by the winds and torrent rains, or lightning lance of Zeus, leaps like a wild beast, and the mountain glens fling back their crashing echoes as it rolls in mad speed on, as with resistless swoop of bound on bound it rushes down, until it cometh to the levels of the plain, and there, perforce, its stormy flight is stayed. So Ares, battle-eager son of Zeus, was stayed, how loath so e'er, for all the gods to the ruler of the blessed needs must yield, seeing he sits high throned above them all, clothed in his might unspeakable. Yet still many a wild thought surged through Ares' soul, urging him now to dread the terrible threat of Cronos' wrathful son, and to return heavenward, and now to reck not of his sire, but with Achilles' blood to stain those hands, the battle tireless. At the last his heart remembered how that many and many a son of Zeus himself in many a war had died, nor in their fall had Zeus availed them aught. Therefore he turned him from the Argives, else down smitten by the blasting thunderbolt with titans in the nether gloom had he lain who dared defy the eternal will of zeus then did the eager sons of argos strip with eager haste from corpses strown all round the blood-stained spoils but ever peleus son gazed wild with all regret still gazed on her the strong the beautiful laid in the dust and all his heart was wrung was broken down with sorrowing love, deep, strong as he had known when that beloved friend Patroclus died. Loud jeered Thersites, mocking to his face, Thou sorry-souled Achilles, art not ashamed to let some evil power beguile thy heart to pity a pitiful Amazon, whose furious spirit purposed naught but ill to us and ours? Pa, woman mad art thou, and thy soul lusts for this thing, as she were some lady wise in household ways, with gifts and pure intent for honoured wedlock wooed. Good had it been her spear reached thine heart, the heart that sighs for woman creatures still. Thou carest not, unmanly soul, not thou, for valour's glorious path, when once thine eye lights on a woman. Sorry wretch, where now was all thy goodly prowess, where thy wit? And where the might that should be see may king all stainless? Dost thou not know what misery this self-same woman madness wrought for Troy? Nothing there is more ruinous for men than lust for woman's beauty. It maketh fools of wise men. But the toil of war attains renown. To him that is a hero indeed, glory of victory, and the war god's works are sweet. Tis but the battle blencher craves the beauty, and the bed as such as she. So railed he, long and loud. The mighty heart of Peleus' son leapt into flame of wrath. A sudden buffet of his resistless hand smote neath the railer's ear, and all his teeth were dashed to the earth. He fell upon his face, forth of his lips the blood in torrent gushed. Swift from his body fled the dastard soul of that vile nittering. Achaea's sons rejoiced thereat, for I he wont to rail on each and all with venomous gibes, himself a scandal and the shame of all the host. Then mid the warrior Argives cried a voice, Not good is it for baser men to rail on kings, or secretly or openly, for wrathful retribution swiftly comes. The lady of justice sits on high, and she who heapeth woe on woe on humankind, even Ate, punisheth the shameless tongue. So mid the Danians cried a voice, nor yet within the mighty soul of Peleus' son lulled was the storm of wrath, but fiercely he spake. Lie there in dust, thy follies all forgot. Tis not for knaves to bear their betters. Once thou didst provoke Odysseus' steadfast soul, babbling with venomous tongue a thousand gibes, and didst escape with life. But thou hast found the son of Peleus not so patient souled who, with one only buffet from his hand, unkennels thy dog's soul. A bitter doom hath swallowed thee. By thine old rascalry thy life is sped. Hence from Achaean men, and mouth out thy revilings midst the dead. So spake the valiant-hearted aweless son of Aeacus. 
But Tydeus' son alone of all the Argives was with anger stirred against Achilles for Thersites slain, seeing these twain were of the selfsame blood, the one proud Tydeus' battle-eager son, the other seed of godlike Agrius. Brother of noble Oneus Agrius was, and Oneus in the Danian land begat Tydeus the battle-eager, son to whom was stalwart Diomedes. Therefore wroth was he for slain Thersites, yea, had raised against the son of Peleus vengeful hands, except the noblest of Achaea's sons had thronged round him, and besought him sore, and held him back therefrom. With Peleus' son they also pleaded, else those mighty twain, the mightiest of all Argives, were at point to close with clash of swords, so stung were they with bitter wrath. Yet hearkened they at last to prayers of comrades, and were reconciled. Then of their pity did the Atriot kings, for these two at the imperial loveliness of Penthesilea marvelled, render up her body to the men of Troy, to bear unto the burg of Ilus far renowned with all her armour. For a herald came, asking this boon for Priam. For the king yearned with deep longing of the heart to lay that battle-eager maiden with her arms and with her war-horse in the great earth-mound of old Laomedon. And so he heaped a high broad pyre without the city wall. Upon the height thereof that warrior queen they laid, and costly treasures did they heap around her, all that well beseems to burn around a mighty queen in battle slain. And so the fire god's swift upleaping might, the ravening flame consumed her. All around the people stood on every hand, and quenched the pyre with odorous wine. Then gathered they the bones, and poured sweet ointment over them, and laid them in a casket. Over all shed they the rich fat of a heifer, chief among the herds that grazed on Ida's slope. And, as for a beloved daughter, rang all round the Trojan men's heart-stricken well, as by the stately wall they buried her on an outstanding tower, beside the bones of old Laomedon, a queen beside a king. This honour for the war-god's sake they rendered, and for Penthesilea's own, and in the plain beside her buried they the Amazons, even all that followed her to battle, and by Argive spears were slain. For Atreus' sons begrudged not these the boon of tear-besprinkled graves, but let their friends, the warrior Trojans, draw their corpses forth, yea, and their own slain also, from amidst the swarth of darts or that grim harvest field. Wrath strikes not at the dead, pitied our foes when life has fled, and left them foes no more. Far across the plain the while uprose smoke from the pyres whereon the Argives laid the many heroes overthrown and slain by Trojan hands, what time the sword devoured. And multitudinous lamentation welled over the perished. But above the rest mourned they our brave Podarces, who in fight was no less mighty than his hero brother Protosilaus, he who long ago fell slain of Hector. So Podarces now, struck down by Penthesilea's spear, hath cast over all Argive hearts the pall of grief. Wherefore, apart from him, they laid in clay the common throng of slain. But over him, toiling, they heaped an earth-mound far descried, in memory of a warrior all is sold. And in a several pit withal, they thrust the nittering Persites' wretched course. Then to the ships, acclaiming Aeacus' son, returned they all. But when the radiant day had plunged beneath the ocean's stream, and night, the holy, overspread the face of earth. Then in the rich king Agamemnon's tent feasted the might of Peleus' son, and there sat at the feast those other mighty ones, all through the dark, till rose the dawn divine. End of chapter 1
by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When, o'er the crest of the far-echoing hills, the splendor of the tireless racing sun poured o'er the land, still in their tents rejoiced Achaia's stalwart sons, and still acclaimed Achilles, the resistless. But in Troy still mourned her people, still from all her towers seaward they strained their gaze. For one great fear gripped all their hearts to see that terrible man at one bound overleap their high-built wall, then smite with the sword all people there within, and burn with fire, fanes, palaces, and homes. And old Thymoteus spake to the anguished ones, Friends, I have lost hope. Mine heart seeth not our help or bulwark from the storm of war. Now that the aweless Hector, who was once Troy's mighty champion, is in the dust laid low, not all his might availed to escape the fates, but overborne he was by Achilles' hands, the hands that would, I verily deem, bear down a god if he defied him to the fight, even as he overthrew this warrior queen, Pethysalea, battle revelling, from whom all of the Argives shrank in fear. Ah, she was marvellous when at the first I looked on her. Me seen a blessed one from heaven had come down hitherward to bring light to our darkness. Oh, vain hope, vain dream. Go to, let us take counsel what to do were best for us. Or shall we still maintain a hopeless fight against these ruthless foes? Or shall we straightway flee a city doomed? I doomed. For never more may we withstand Argives in fighting field, When in the front of battle pitiless Achilles storms. Then spake Laomedon's son, the ancient king, Nay, friend, and all ye other sons of Troy, And ye, our strong war helpers, Flinch we not faint-hearted from defence of fatherland. Yet let us go not forth to the city gates To battle with yon foe. Nay, from our towers, and from our ramparts let us make defence, Till our new champion come, The stormy heart of Memnon. Lo, he cometh, Leading on host numberless, Ethiopia's swarthy sons. By this I trow he is nigh unto our gates, For long ago, in sore distress of soul, I sent him urgent summons. Yea, and he promised me, Gladly promised me, To come to Troy, And make all end of all our woes. Now I trust he is nigh. Let us endure a little longer then, for better far it is like brave men in the fight to die than flee and live in shame mid alien folk. So spake the old king, but Polydamus, the prudent-hearted, thought not good to war thus endlessly, and spake his patriot reed. If Memnon have, beyond all shadow of doubt, pledged him to thrust dire ruin far from us, then do I gainsay not that we await the coming of that godlike man within our walls. Ah, yet mine heart misgives me, lest, though he with all his warriors come, he come but to his death, and unto thousands more our people not but misery come thereof. For terribly against us leaps the storm of the Achaeans' might. But now go to, let us not flee afar from this our Troy, to wander in some alien land, and there, in the exile's pitiful helplessness, endure all flouts and outrage. Nor in our own land abide we, till the storm of Argive war our whelm us. Nay, even now, late though it be, better it were for us to render back unto the Danians Helen and her wealth, even all that glory of women brought with her from Sparta. And add other treasure. Yea, we pay it twofold, so to save our Troy and our own souls. While yet the spoiler's hand is laid not on our substance, and while yet Troy hath not sunk in gulfs of ravening flame, I pray you, take to heart my counsel. None shall, while I wot, be
be given to Trojan men better than this. Ah, would that long ago Hector had hearkened to my pleading, when I fain had kept him in the ancient home. So spake Polydamus, the noble and strong, and all the listening Trojans in their hearts approved. Yet none dared utter openly the word, for all with trembling held in awe their prince and Helen, though for her soul's sake daily they died. But on that noble man turned Paris, and reviled him to his face. Thou dastard battle venture Polydamus! Not in thy craven bosom beats a heart that bides the fight, but only fear and panic. Yet dost thou vaunt thee, quotha, still our best in counsel? No man's soul is base as thine. Go to, thyself shrink shivering from the strife. Cower, coward in thine halls. But all the rest, we men, will still go armor girt until we wrest from this our truceless war a peace that shall not shame us tis with travail and toil of strenuous war that brave men win renown but flight weak women choose it and young babes thy spirit is like to theirs no wit i trust thee in the day of battle thee the man who maketh faint the hearts of all the host so fiercely he reviled Polydamus wrathfully answered, for he shrank not, he from answering to his face. A caitiff hound, a reptile fool is he, who fawns on men before their faces, while his heart is black with malice, and, when they be gone, his tongue backbites them. Openly, Polydamus flung back upon the prince his taunt and scoff. O oh, thou of living men most mischievous! Thy valour, quotha, brings us misery. Thine heart endures, and will endure, That strife should have no limit, Save an utter ruin of fatherland And people for thy sake. Ne'er may such want with valour craze my soul. Be mine to cherish wise discretion, I, a warder that shall keep mine house in peace. Indignantly he spake, and Paris found no word to answer him, for conscience woke remembrance of all woes he had brought on Troy, and should bring, for his passion-fevered heart would rather hail quick death than severance from Helen, the divinely fair, although for her sake was it that the sons of Troy even then were gazing from the towers to see the Argives and Achilles drawing nigh. But no long time thereafter came to them Memnon, the warrior king, and brought with him a countless host of swarthy Ethiopes. From all the streets of Troy the Trojans flocked, glad-eyed to gaze on him. As seafarers, with ruining tempest utterly forspent, see through the wide parting clouds the radiance of the eternal wheeling northern wain, so joyed the Troy folk as they thronged around, and more than all, Laomedon's son, for now leapt in his heart a hope that yet the ships might by those Ethiop men be burned with fire. So giant-like their king was, and themselves so huge a host, and so a thirst for fight. Therefore, with all observance, welcomed he the strong son of the Lady of the Dawn, with goodly gifts and with abundant cheer. So at the banquet king and hero sat and talked. This telling of the Danian chiefs, and all the woes himself had suffered, that telling of that strange immortality by the dawn goddess given to his sire, telling of the unending flow and ebb of the sea mother, of the sacred flood of ocean, fathomless rolling, of the bounds of earth that wearieth never of her travail, of where the sun steeds leap from orient waves, telling withal of all his wayfaring, from ocean's verge to Priam's wall and spurs of Ida. Yea, he told how his strong hand smote the great army of the Solomy, who barred his way, whose deed presumptuous brought upon their own heads crushing ruin and woe. So told he all that marvellous tale, and told of countless tribes and nations seen of him. And Priam heard, 
and ever glowed his heart within him and the old lips answering spake memnon the gods are good who have vouchsafed to me to look upon thine host and thee here in mine halls oh that their grace would so crown this their boon that i might see my foes all thrust to one destruction by thy spears that well may be for marvellous like art thou to some invincible deathless one yea more than any earthly hero wherefore thou i trust shalt hurl wild havoc through their host but now i pray thee for this day do thou cheer at my feast thine heart and with the morn shalt thou go forth to battle worthy of thee then in his hands a chalice deep and wide he raised and memnon in all love he pledged in that huge golden cup a gift of gods for this the cunning godsmith brought to zeus his masterpiece what time the mighty in power to hephaestus gave for bride the cyperian queen and zeus on dardanus his godlike son bestowed it he on erichthonius erichthonius to troas the great of heart gave it and he with all his treasure store bequeathed it to ilus and he gave that wonder to laomedon and he to priam who had thought to leave the same to his own son fate ordered otherwise and memnon clasped his hands about that cup so peerless beautiful and all his heart marvelled and thus he spake unto the king beseems not with great swelling words to vaunt amidst the feast and lavish promises but rather quietly to eat in hall and to devise deeds worthy whether i be brave and strong or whether i be not battle wherein a man's true might is seen shall prove to thee now would i rest nor drink the long night through the battle-eager spirit by measureless wine and lack of sleep is dulled marvelled at him the old king and he said as seems thee good touching the banquet do after thy pleasure i for thou art loath will not constrain thee yea unmeet is it to hold him back who fain would leave the board or hurry from one's halls who fain would stay so is the good old law with all true men then rose that champion from the board and passed thence to his sleep his last and with him went all others from the banquet to their rest and gentle sleep slid down upon them soon but in the halls of zeus the lightning lord feasted the gods the while and chronos son all father of his deep foreknowledge spake amidst them of the issue of the strife be it known unto you all to morn shall bring by yonder war affliction swift and sore for many mighty horses shall ye see and i their host beside their chariots slain and many heroes perishing therefore ye remember these my words howe'er ye grieve for dear ones let none clasp my knees in prayer since even to us relentless are the fates so warned he them which knew before that all should from the battle stand aside howe'er heart wrung that none petitioning for a son or dear one should to olympus vainly come so at that warning of the thunderer the son of kronos all they steel their hearts to bear and spake no word against their king for in exceeding awe they stood of him yet to their several mansions and their rest with sore hearts went they o'er their deathless eyes the blessing bringer sleep his light veil spread when o'er precipitous crest of mountain walls leapt up broad heaven the bright morning star who rouseth to their toils from slumber sweet the binders of the sheep then his last sleep unclasped the warrior son of her who brings light to the world the child of mist of night now swelled his mighty heart with eagerness to battle with the foe forthright and dawn with most reluctant feet began to climb heaven's broad highway 
Then did the Trojans gird their battle harness on. Then armed themselves the Ethiop men, and all the mingled tribes of those war helpers that from many lands to Priam's aid were gathered. Forth the gates swiftly they rushed, like darkly lowering clouds, which Cronos' son, when storm is rolling up, herdeth together through the welkin wide. Swiftly the whole plain filled. Onward they streamed like harvest ravening locusts, drifting on in fashion of heavy brooding rain clouds o'er the wide plains of earth. An irresistible host, bringing wan famine on the sons of men. So in their might and multitude they went. The city streets were all too straight for them, marching up soared the dust from underfoot. From far the Argives gazed, and marvelling saw their onrush, but with speed arrayed their limbs in brass, and in the might of Peleus' son put their glad trust. Amidst them rode he on, like to a giant titan, glorying in steeds and chariot, while his armour flashed splendour around in sudden lightning gleams. It was as when the sun from utmost bounds of earth-encompassing ocean comes, and brings light to the world, and flings his splendor wide through heaven, and earth and air laugh all around. So glorious mid the Argives, Peleus' son rode onward. Mid the Trojans rode the while Memnon the hero, even such to see as Ares, furious-hearted. Onward swept the eager host, arrayed about their lord. Then, in the grapple of war, on either side closed the long lines, Trojan and Danian, but chief in prowess still the Ethiops were. Crashed they together, as when surges meet on the wild sea, when, in a day of storm from every quarter, winds to battle rush. Foe hurled at foe the ashen spear, and slew. Screams and death groans went up like roaring fire. As when down thundering torrents shout and rave on pouring seaward, when the maddened rains stream from God's cisterns, when the huddling clouds are hurled against each other ceaselessly, and leaps their fiery breath in flashes forth, so neath the fighter's trampling feet the earth thundered, and leapt the terrible battle yell through the frenzied air, for mad the war cries were. For first fruits of death's harvest, Peleus' son slew Thalius, and Mentus, nobly born, men of renown, and many a head beside dashed he to dust. As in his furious swoop a whirlwind shakes dark chasms underground, and earth's foundations crumble and melt away, Round the deep roots of the shuddering world. So the ranks crumbled in swift doom to the dust Before the spear and fury of Peleus' son. But on the other side, the hero child of the dawn goddess Slew the Argive men, like to a baleful doom Which bringeth down on men a grim and ghastly pestilence. First he slew Pharaon, for the bitter spear plunged through his breast, and down on him he hurled goodly Aruthus, battle revellers both, dwellers in Thyrus by Alpha's streams, which followed Nestor to the god built burg of Ilium. But when he had laid these low, against the son of Neleus pressed he on, eager to slay. God like Antilochus strode forth to meet him, sped the long spear's flight, yet missed him, for a little he swerved, but slew his Ethiop comrade, son of Parhasis. Wroth for his fall, against Antilochus he leapt, as leaps a lion mad of mood upon a boar, the beast that flincheth not from fight with man or brute, whose charge is a flash of lightning, so was his swift leap. His foe, Antilochus, caught a huge stone from the ground, hurled, smote him, but unshaken abode his strength, for the strong helm crest fenced his head from death but rang the morion round his brows. His heart kindled with terrible fury at the blow, more than before, against Antilochus. Like seething cauldron, 
spoiled his maddened might he stabbed for all his cunning offence the son of nestor above the breast the crashing spear plunged to the heart the spot of speediest death then upon all the danians at his fall came grief but anguish stricken was the heart of nestor most of all to see his son slain in his sight for no more bitter pang smiteth the heart of man than when a son perishes and his father sees him die therefore albeit unused to melting mood his soul was torn with agony for the son by black death slain a wild cry hastily to Phasimedes did he send afar hither to me Phasimedes, war renowned help me to thrust back from thy brother's course yea mine hapless son his murderer that so ourselves may render to our dead all dues of mourning if thou fledge for fear no son of mine art thou nor of the line of periclymnus who dared withstand hercules self come to the battle toil for grim necessity oft times inspires the very coward with courage of despair then at his cry that brother's heart was stung with bitter grief swift for his help drew nigh Phereus, on whom for his great prince's fall came anguish charge these warriors twain to face strong memnon in the gory strife as when two hunters mid a forest mountain folds eager to take the prey rush on to meet a wild boar or a bear with hearts of fire to slay him but in furious mood he leaps on them and holds at bay the might of men so swelled the heart of memnon nay true they yet vainly essayed to slay him as they hurled the long spears but the lances glanced aside far from his flesh the dawn queen turned them thence yet fell their spears not vainly to the ground the lance of fiery-hearted Phereus, winged with eager speed dealt death to meges son polymnius laomedon was slain by the wrath of nestor's son for a brother dead the dear one memnon slew in battle rout and whom the slayer's war unwearied hands now stripped of all his brazen battle gear not recking he of thrasymedes might nor of stout Phereus, who are unto him but weaklings a great lion seemed he there standing above a heart as jackals they that how so hungry dare not come too nigh but hard thereby the father gazed thereon in agony and cried the rescue cry to other his war comrades for their aid against the foe himself too Turned to fight from his war car, for yearning for the dead goaded him to the fray beyond his strength. Aye, and himself had been on his dear son laid, numbered with the dead. Had not the voice of Memnon stayed him, even in act to rush upon him, for he reverenced in his heart the white hairs of an age mate of his sire. Ancient, he cried, it were my shame to fight with one so much mine elder i am not blind unto honour verily i ween that this was some young warrior when i saw thee facing thus the foe my bold heart hoped for contest worthy of mine hand and spear nay draw thou back afar from battle toil and bitter death go lest bold so e'er i smite thee of sore need nay fall thou not beside thy son against a mightier man fighting lest men with folly thee should charge for folly it is that braves our mastering might he spake and answered him that warrior old nay memnon vain was that last word of thine none would name fool the father who essayed battling with foes for his son's sake to thrust the ruthless slayer back from that dear corpse but ah that my strength were whole in me that thou mightst know my spear now canst thou vaunt proudly enow a young man's heart is bold and light his wit uplifted is thy soul in vain thy speech if in my strength of youth thou hadst met me ta thy friends had not rejoiced for all thy might 
But me a grievous weight of age bows down, Like an old lion, whom a cur may boldly Drive back from the fold, for that he cannot In his wrath's despite maintain his own cause, Being toothless now, and strengthless, And his strong heart tamed by time, so well the springs of olden strength no more in my breast. Yet am I stronger still than many men. My gray hairs yield to few that have within them all the strength of youth. So drew he back a little space, and left lying in the dust his son, since no more lived in the once lithe limbs the old in strength, for the year's weight lay heavy on his head. Back left Thrasymedes likewise, Spearmen good and battle-eager Phereus, And the rest their comrades, For that slaughter-dealing man Pressed hard on them. As when, from mountains high, A shouting river with wide-echoing din Sweeps down its fathomless whirlpool Through the gloom, when God, With tumult of mighty storm, Hath palled the sky in cloud From verge to verge. When thunders crash all round, when thick and fast gleam lightnings from the huddling clouds, when fields are flooded as the hissing rain descends, and all the air is filled with awful roar of torrents pouring down the hill ravines, so Memnon, toward the shores of Hellespont before him, hurled the Argives, following hard behind them, slaughtering ever. Many a man fell in the dust, and left his life in blood neath Ethiop hands. Stained was the earth with gore as Danians died. Exalted Memnon's soul as on the ranks of foemen ever he rushed, and heaped with dead was all the plain of Troy, and still from fight refrained he not. He hoped to be a light of safety unto Troy, and bane to Danians. But all the while stood baleful doom beside him, and spurred on to strife with flattering smile. To right, to left, his stalwart helpers wrought in battle toil, Alcinous and Nicias, and the son of Asius, furious soul, Menecleus' spear, Clydon, and Alexippus. Yea, a host eager to chase the foe, men who in fight quick them like men, exulting in their king. Then, as Menicleus on the Danians charged, the son of Neleus slew him. Wroth for his friend, whole throngs of foes fierce-hearted Memnon slew. As when a hunter midst the mountains drives swift deer with the dark lines of his toils, the eager ring of beaters closing in presses the huddled throng into snares of death. The dogs are wild with joy of the chase, ceaselessly giving tongue, the while his darts leaped winged with death on brocket and on hind. So Memnon slew, and ever slew, his men rejoiced, the while in panic-stricken rout before that glorious man the Argives fled. As when from a steep mountain's precipice bough leaps a huge crag, which all resistless Zeus by stroke of thunderbolt hath hurled from the crest. Crash oakwood copses, echo long ravines, shudders the forest to its rattle and roar, and flocks therein, and herds and wild things flee, scattering, as bounding, whirling, it descends with pitiless onrush. So his foes fled from the lightning flash of Memnon's spear. Then to the side of Aeacus' mighty son came Nestor. Anguish for his son he cried, Achilles, thou great bulwark of the Greeks, slain is my child. The armor of my dead hath Memnon, and I fear me lest his course be cast a prey to dogs. Haste to his help, True friend is he who still remembereth a friend though slain, and grieves for one no more. Achilles heard, and his heart was thrilled with grief. He glanced across the rolling battle, saw Memnon, saw where in throngs the Argives fell beneath his spear. Forthright he turned away from where the rifted ranks of Troy fell fast before his hands, and, 
thirsting for the fight, Wroth for Antilochus and the others slain, Came face to face with Memnon. In his hands that godlike hero Caught up from the ground a stone, A boundary mark twixt the fields of wheat, And hurled. Down on the shield of Peleus' son It crashed. But he, the invincible, Shrank not before the huge rock shard, But, thrusting out his long lance, Rushed to close with him afoot, For his steed stayed behind the battle rout. On the right shoulder above the shield He smote and staggered him, But he, despite the wound, Fought on with heart unquelling. Swiftly he thrust, and pricked with his long spear Achilles' arm. Forth gushed the blood, rejoicing with vain joy To Aeacus' son with arrogant words, he cried, Now shalt thou in thy death fill up, I trow, thy dark doom, Overmastered by mine hands. Thou shalt not from this fray escape alive. Fool, wherefore hast thou ruthlessly destroyed Trojans, and vaunted thee the mightiest man of men, a deathless nerded son? Ha! Now thy doom hath found thee. Of birth divine am I, the dawn queen's mighty son, nurtured afar by lily slender Hesperid maids beside the ocean river. Therefore not from thee, nor from grim battle shrink I, Knowing well how far my mother goddess doth transcend a nerid, Whose child thou vauntest thee. To gods and men my mother bringeth light, On her depends the issue of all things. Works great and glorious in Olympus wrought, Whereof comes blessing unto men. But thine, she sits in the barren crypts of brine. She dwells, glorying mid dumb sea monsters, mid fish, deedless, unseen. Nothing I reck of her, nor rank her with the immortal heavenly ones. In stern rebuke spake Aeacus all his son. Memnon, how wast thou so distraught of wit that thou shouldst face me? And to fight defy me, who in might, in blood, in stature far surpass thee. From supremest Zeus I trace my glorious birth, And from the strong sea-god Nerys, Begetter of the maids of the sea, the Nerids, Honoured of the Olympian gods. And chiefest of them all is Thetis, Wise with wisdom world-renowned. For in her bowers she sheltered Dionysus, Chased by might of murderous Lycurgus from the earth. Yea, and the cunning godsmith welcomed she within her mansion, When from heaven he fell. Ay, and the lightning lord once she released from bounds. The all-seeing dwellers in the sky Remember all these things, and reverence my mother Thetis In divine Olympus. Ay, that she is a goddess shalt thou know, when to thine heart the brazen spear shall pierce, sped by my might. Patroclus' death avenged I on Hector, and Antilochus on thee will I avenge. No weakling's friend thou hast slain. But why, like witless children, stand we here, babbling our parents' fame and our own deeds? Now is the hour when prowess shall decide. Then from the sheath he flashed his long keen sword, and Memnon his. And swiftly in fiery fight closed they, And rained the never-ceasing blows upon the bucklers, Which, with craft divine, Hephaestus' self had fashioned. Once and again clashed they together, And their cloudy crests touched, Mingling all their tossing storm of hair. And Zeus, for that he loved them both, Inspired with prowess each, And mightier than their wont he made them, Made them tireless, Nothing like to men but gods, And gloated o'er the twain the queen of strife. In eager fury these thrust swiftly out the spear, With fell intent to reach the throat, Twixt buckler rim and helm, Thrust many a time and oft. Hard and fast they lunged, 
and on their shoulders clash the arms divine roared to the very heavens the battle shout of warring men of trojans ethiops and argives mighty hearted while the dust rolled up from neath their feet tossed to the sky in stress of battle travail great and strong as when a mist enshrouds the hills what time roll up the rain clouds and the torrent beds roar as they fill with rushing floods and howls each gorge with fearful voices shepherds quake to see the waters downrush and the mist scream to dear wolves and all the wild fierce things nursed in the wide arms of the forest around the fighters feet the choking dust hung hiding the fair splendour of the sun and darkening all the heaven sore distressed with dust and deadly conflict were the folk then with a sudden hand some blessed one swept the dust pall aside and the gods saw the deadly fates hurling their charging lines together in the unending wrestle locked of that grim conflict saw where never ceased ares from hideous slaughter saw the earth crimsoned all around with rushing streams of blood saw where dark havoc gloated o'er the scene saw the wide plain with corpses heaped even all bounded twixt simoas and xanthos where they swept from ida down to hellespont but when long lengthened out the conflict was of those two champions and the might of both in that strong tug and strain was equal matched then gazing from olympus far off heights the gods joyed some in the invincible son of peleus others in the goodly child of old tithonus and the queen of dawn thundered the heavens on high from east to west and roared the sea from verge to verge and rocked the dark earth neath the hero's feet and quaked proud nerus daughters all round thetis thronged in grievous fear for mighty achilles sake and trembled for her son the child of mist as in her chariot through the sky she rode marvelled the daughters of the sun who stood near her round that wondrous splendour ring traced for the race course of the tireless sun by zeus the limit of all nature's life and death the daily round that maketh up the eternal circuit of the rolling years and now amongst the blessed bitter feud had broken out but by behest of zeus the twin fates suddenly stood beside these twain one dark her shadow fell on memnon's heart one bright her radiant haloed peleus son and with a great cry the immortals saw and filled with sorrow they of the one part were they of the other with triumphant joy still in the midst of blood-stained battle rout those heroes fought unknowing of the fates now drawn so nigh but each at the other hurled his whole heart's courage all his bodily might thou hadst said that in the strife of that dread day huge tireless giants or strong titans ward so fiercely blazed the wildfire of their strife now when they clashed with swords now when they leapt hurling huge stones nor would either give back before the hell of blows nor quelled they stood like storm tormented headlong steadfast clothed with might past words unearthly for the twain alike could boast their lineage of high zeus therefore twixt these eno lengthened out the ever ballad strife while ever they in that grim wrestle strained their uttermost they and their dauntless comrades round their kings with ceaseless fury toiling till their spears stood shivered all in shields of warriors slain and of the fighters woundless none remained but from the limbs streamed down into the dust the blood and sweat of that unresting strain of fight and earth was hidden with the dead as heaven is hidden with clouds when meets the sun the goat star 
and the shipman dreads the deep. As charge the lines, the snorting chariot steeds trample the dead, as are the myriad leaves ye trample in the woods at entering in of winter, when the autumn tide is past. Still mid the corpses and the blood fought on those glorious sons of gods, nor ever ceased from wrath of fight. But Eris, thou inclined the fatal scales of battle, which no more were equal poised. Beneath the breastbone then of godlike Memnon plunged Achilles' sword. Clear through his body all the dark blue blade leapt. Suddenly snapped the silver cord of life. Down in a pool of blood he fell, and clashed his massy armor, and earth rang again. Then turned to flight his comrades, panic-struck, and of his arms the Myrmidon stripped the dead, while fled the Trojans, and Achilles chased, as whirlwind swift and mighty to destroy. Then groaned the dawn, and palled herself in clouds and earth was darkened. At their mother's hest, all the light breathings of the dawn took hands, and slid down one long stream of sighing wind to Priam's plain, and floated round the dead, and softly, swiftly caught they up, and bare through silver mist the dawn queen's son, with hearts sore aching for their brother's fall while moaned around them all the air as on they passed fell many blood gouts from those pierced limbs down to the earth and these were made a sign to generations yet to be the gods gathered them up from many lands and made thereof a far resounding river Named of all that dwell beneath long Ida's flanks, Paphlagonium. As its waters flow twixt fertile acres, Once a year they turn to blood, When comes the woeful day whereon died Memnon. Thence a sick and choking reek steams, Thou wouldst say that from a wound unhealed, Corrupting humours breathed an evil stench. Aye, so the gods ordained. But now flew on, bearing dawn's mighty sun, the rushing winds, skimming earth's face, and palled about with night. Nor were his Ethiopian comrades left to wander of their king forlorn. A god suddenly winged those eager souls with speed, such as should be theirs for ever. Changed to flying fowl, the children of the air. Wailing their king in the wind's track they sped. As when a hunter mid the forest breaks is by a boar or grim-jawed lion slain, and now his sorrowing friends take up the course and bear it, heavy-hearted, and the hounds follow low whimpering, pining for their lord in that disastrous hunting lost, so they, left far behind that stricken field of blood, and fast they followed after those swift winds with multitudinous moaning, veiled in mist unearthly. Trojans over all the plain, and Danians marveled, seeing that great host vanishing with their king. All hearts stood still in dumb amazement, but the tireless winds, sighing, set hero Memnon's giant corpse down by the deep flow of Esopus stream. Where is a fair grove of the bright-haired nymphs, the which round his long barrel afterward Esopus' daughters planted, screening it with many and manifold trees? And long and loud well those immortals, Chanting his renown, the son of the dawn goddess, splendor throned. Now sank the sun, the lady of the morn, 
wailing her dear child from the heavens came down. Twelve maidens, shining tressed, attended her. The warders of the high paths of the sun were ever circling, warders of the night and dawn, and each world ordinance framed of Zeus, around whose mansions everlasting doors from east to west they dance, from west to east, whirling the wheels of harvest-laden years, while rolls the endless round of winter's cold, and flowery spring, and lovely summer-tide, and heavy-clustered autumn. These came down from heaven, for Memnon wailing wild and high, and mourned with these the Pleiades, echoed round far-stretching mountains in a sopus stream. Ceaseless uprose the keen, and in their midst, fallen on her son, and clasping, well the dawn. Dead art thou, my dear, dear child, and thou hast clad thy mother with a pall of grief. O oh, I, now thou art slain, will not endure to light the immortal heavenly ones. No. I will plunge down to the dread depths of the underworld, where thy lone spirit flitteth to and fro, and will to blind night leave earth, sky and sea, till chaos and formless darkness brood o'er all. That Kronos' son may also learn what means anguish of heart, for not less worship worthy than Nerys child by Zeus's ordinance am I who look on all things, I, who bring all to their consummation. Recklessly my light Zeus now despiseth, therefore I will pass into the darkness. Let him bring up to Olympus Thetis from the sea, to hold for him light forth to gods and men. My sad soul loveth darkness more than day, lest I pour light upon thy slayer's head. Thus as she cried, the tears ran down her face immortal, like a river brimming eye. Drenched was the dark earth round the course. The night grieved in her daughter's anguish, and the heaven drew over all his stars a veil of mist and cloud of love unto the Lady of Light. Meanwhile, within their walls the Trojan folk for Memnon sorrowed sore, with vain regret, yearning for that lost king and all his host. Nor greatly joyed the Argives, where they lay, camped in the open plain amidst the dead. There, mingled with Achilles' praise, uprose wails for Antilochus, joy clasped hands with grief. All night, in groans and sighs most pitiful, the Dawn Queen lay. A sea of darkness moaned around her. Of the day spring naught she wrecked. She loathed Olympus' spaces. At her side, fretted and whinnied still her fleet-foot steeds, trampling the strange earth, gazing at their queen grief-stricken, yearning for the fiery course. Suddenly, Crashed the thunder of the wrath of Zeus, Rocked round her all the shuddering earth, And on immortal Eos trembling came. Swiftly the dark-skinned Ethiopes from her sight Buried their lord, lamenting, As they wailed unceasingly, The dawn-queen, lovely-eyed, Changed them to birds, Sweeping through air around the barrow of the mighty dead. And these still do the tribes of men the Memnons call. And still, with wailing cries, they dart and wheel above their king's tomb. And they scatter dust down on his grave. Still shrill the battle cry in memory of Memnon, each to each. But he, in Hades' mansion, or perchance amid the blessed on the Elysian plain, laugheth. 
divine dawn comforteth her heart beholding them but theirs is toil of strife unending till the weary victors strike the vanquished dead or one and all fill up the measure of their doom around his grave so by command of eos lady of light the swift birds dree their weird but dawn divine now heavenward soared with all the fostering hours who drew her to zeus threshold sorely loath yet conquered by their gentle pleadings such as salve the bitterest grief of broken hearts nor the dawn queen forget her daily course but quell before the unbending threat of zeus of whom are all things even all comprised within the encircling sweep of ocean's stream earth and the palace dome of burning stars before her went her pleiad harbingers then she herself flung wide the ethereal gates and scattering spray of splendour flashed therethrough End of chapter 2